So hello everyone, those who are really looking forward to have a better uh, grasp of how to design your research. Today, we're going to talk about very two important things and that includes ontology and epistemology. So before we proceed, don't forget to subscribe and hit the ring button and don't forget to comment in the comment section uh, box regarding all your insights regarding our discussion for today. So without further ado, let us now begin. Right. So we're going to talk about the following key topics. These are the key points of our discussion uh, today. First is the basic principles of research design. So what are the principles when you design research and what are the important philosophies that you really need to look into? And then we're going to talk about a very important topic, an area of a philosophical study about ontology and we're going to define it clearly simply so that everyone can understand and we're going to talk about epistemology also which is also another very important uh, basis for designing your research and then the role of you as the researcher how would you adjust based on the philosophical stance that you are standing also on how you would want to answer the problems or the queries the inquiry that you would want to conduct as a researcher right so we're going to proceed now to the basic principles of research design so uh, the very basic is ontology so what is ontology when you say research the very basic fo foundation is really uh, one of this we also we always hear about ontology so what is ontology so this is a philosophical study of being so this talks about how you view the world or it's in, in other words, it's like how you view reality. So under ontology, you take into consideration the assumptions that you make about the nature of the world and of reality. So let me ask you a question. What is real for you? How would you know if the thing is real? How would you know if something is really existing? Okay. Uh, are you sure that what you perceive right now is not a dream? Let's just theoretically just put yourself in a in a position where you are dreaming while you are dreaming you may think that what you are dreaming about may be the reality itself and you will never really realize unless you are already awakened all those questions are under ontology this is a philosophical study of being and the question that we ask is what is really reality and up until now there are many debates about this right even to the point that there are you know experiments being conducted one of the very famous experiment that is being conducted is the double slit experiment wherein atoms are bombarded in a double slip and then the observation was that if no one is watching the atoms going through the slit it seems like atoms behave like waves meaning it doesn't behave like a particle but if someone is watching it then suddenly it turns into a concrete object and it turns into a particle so the the act alone of observing something actually brings it to being brings it instead of being a wave or an energy it turns into something physical it turns into a particle so uh, albert einstein has put this very clearly when he said i would like to think that the moon exists even if i'm not watching it Right? So the idea here is if you're not watching the moon, the moon could just be a, a form of a wave or an energy and it just turns into some solid moon if you try looking at it. So every time someone perceives it or looks at it or observes it, it turns into something physical. There are many questions boggling us about reality and it has been an ongoing debate. So ontology is really about what makes something real and how do you describe reality? We're going to talk more about it, uh, this as we go on, but this is a very interesting topic. And this philosophical study has been a subject of very huge debates. Okay, So we can go on and on. We can talk about a lot of philosophical stance regarding this one. But uh, we will see later on that uh, reality is still something that is very elusive in a sense that we really don't know what is real. Right? So that's all about ontology. But what are the different schools of ontology? So there are actually four main schools of ontology. So these, uh, what we see here is a spectrum of the schools of ontology from being extremely realist 
to something that is nominal or relativist. All right. So to give you an idea about it, I made a summary here. This is actually taken from the Management of Research for Fourth Edition by Esther by Smith, Thorpe and Jackson. So what we see here is a summary. Then we have the truth, how they view the truth. How do they view facts? So for realism, what we see is that the world is real. And science proceeds by examining it and observing it, right? So real is really independent from our mind. And for under realism, so under realism, the truth is a single truth. It's a single truth that no one can change. If, if the truth is something like that, it, it doesn't have any, many versions of itself. The truth is the truth, right? So it doesn't have any other versions. No version point one, version point two, right? So it's really up to you to uncover the truth. So that's a realism. And for facts, um, the, the realist will perceive it as a fact is, exists and can be revealed through experiment. So you can only experiment and try to look at how these uh, facts are to be. And then we try to validate it through uh, the experiments that we conduct. Moving to the spectrum towards nominalism, is internal realism. So how does it differ with realism? So the summary is there. The world is real, but it it is almost impossible to examine it directly. So you see there's a little bit of, uh, you know, moving towards another direction here because it recognizes that the world is real, but it is impossible to really comprehend it. And for the truth, the truth exists, but it's not really clear. It's obscure for an internal realist, right? So the facts, how about facts? Facts are concrete, but cannot always be revealed. So there are times that the, the, the facts are hard to be revealed, right? Because for an extreme realist, the fact exists and it's really there and it can be revealed, right? So we see here another one. It's relat relativism. So this is now in the other end of the spectrum. We see that, uh, according to this, the scientific laws are basically created by people to fit their view of reality. So there's no really scientific laws and they are actually only there because people fit it based on how they perceive reality. All right? And for a relativist, there are many truths. So when you look at something, right, depending on the perspective, it actually changes. So there are many versions of the truth for a relativist. And in terms of facts, facts depend on the viewpoint of the observer. So we have nominalism. So for a nominalist, reality is entirely created by people and there is no external truth. So it's like dreaming. When you're dreaming, you don't really see your dream as something that is a dream or unreal. During the time that you're dreaming, you think that, this is your reality. But you will only realize when you wake up. Alright, so how about this world now? Are we, is this really real? Or will we wake up later on and realize that everything was just a dream? Right, so those are questions we need to ask. But for a nominalist, the truth, reality is only created because we have and we are capable of perceiving. So therefore, a nominalist will claim that there is no truth. The truth exists in our mind, right? So facts. Facts are all human creations, meaning it is the human brain that creates facts, okay? So there is a lot of, we call this one nominalism, right? So a realist will attempt, so how, do, how, how, does, how does a researcher go about this one? So if you're a realist, what you will do is you will attempt to uncover the truth. Well, a relativist will be interested in exploring the different people's ideas of the truth. All right, so we see here the difference. Okay, so we'll now proceed to a very important thing that we need to take note. Before designing your research, you should consider how your investigation fits the bigger picture of the world. So how you perceive the world, how you perceive reality, and how you chose to investigate it. And please take note, that everything we have here a while ago, there are no correct views here. But if you want to, you know, 
um, if there are things that you want to share about how you view reality, you may write it in the comment section below and I will be very interested to know regarding how you view your reality and how will this affect your research mythologies or methods. Right? Right? So, let's now proceed to epistemology. So, under epistemology, remember that this is a philosophical study of the origin of knowledge. So, since we are perceiving reality, a while ago we talked about reality and how this affects how we investigate the world. But, there's a, a philosophical study really designed in acquiring knowledge. So, th- the way we perceive the world affects how we want to know more about it. Okay? So, that is why epistemology was born. It deals with the best way of investigating the world and its reality. So, it also deals with how we should differentiate between justified belief and opinion. Right? So, when we perceive reality as it is, remember that that reality is where we try to acquire that knowledge. Okay? So how should we go about doing it? And this is now what we call epistemology. Right. So there are two main schools of epistemology just to make it very simple because all others are really a, a, a spectrum or a degree going from the other side of the spectrum to the other side. So the extreme is the positivist and they believe that we can study the world best through objective observations. There should be no bias, no emotions. As much as possible, we need to be impartial with how we study the world because for a positivist, the view of the world is more like of a realist, right? So we're now combining uh, ontology and epistemology. So when you're a positivist, you believe that somewhere out there, you are positive that a truth and a reality exists. And that reality is consistent and independent of perception. So no matter how you perceive it, no matter how you see it, the truth is the truth and no one can change it. Being objective, therefore, under positivist is very important. Okay, So if you're developing this stance that you believe that uh, you know, the reality exists out there. Uh, you can conduct your observations in an impartial way. The exact opposite of the school of epistemology is the co- social constructionist. So they believe that the reality does not exist by itself. Reality for social constructivists is created by people. And this changes the focus of the feelings, beliefs, and thoughts of the individual. Right? So we see here that more like a nominalist in a sense that he believes that reality does not exist. So how does he investigate the world? So he listens to the feelings and beliefs and thoughts of the individual because what changes, what shapes reality is actually the perception and the feelings and how the person perceives. You know, in a sense, these are the ideas of reality that are inside. So that's how a social constructionist will explore this world. So th- those are the two main schools of epistemology. Right. So what are the key insights and action points? The thing here is that all philosophical study mentioned are considered valid. So there's really no right or wrong here. We can debate all day about how we perceive reality and we will not, you know, it's, it's hard to get it done because even until now, for years, uh, reality has been changing, right? So many research studies has been conducted working in all these philosophical stances. The key, however, is to be consistent with the methods you employ. So if you are doing positivist, you should actually do employ, you know, research methods that will fit your philosophical stance. If you're doing, um, you know, the other extreme side of the spectrum, you should make sure that you employ the methods appropriate for it, right? So you may use interviews, listen to their thoughts, use qualitative research methods, listen to their ideas, do qualitative research. All right, so we're going to proceed now as to how this two important philosophical study influence how we employ our methods. So a realist Let's try to look at this. The realists will tend to be more inclined to the use of positivist epistemology. So this usually starts with a hypothesis. 
and proceeds with conducting an experiment. So there is um, a very intellectual guess and then they are going to do some experiment and they will try to prove or disprove it, right? And they will therefore confirm the theory they anchored to their study. I think this is very familiar to you. This kind of approach is what you call quantitative research methods. We're going to talk more about that later, but please take note that the basis of the hypo hypothesis was the theory that they either adapted or created. So you have two options, but this is more like a quantitative research approach. All right, so on the other side, we have the relativist. So what does a relativist will actually do in terms of methods? So they take into consideration the social constructionist epistemology. So they usually start with questions as to how and why, and then conduct case studies and surveys to which they triangulate and compare. So they actually study the patterns, they study the patterns, and they try to look at what certain new theories can they generate out from the patterns they see, right? So we see here a more quant qualitative research approach, okay? Or descriptive in a sense. So the critical points that we need to take into consideration, the social constructionist approaches tend to draw on qualitative sources of data, while a positivist with quantitative data. So what is quantitative data? It's about quantities. So there are numbers we count. And then the qualitative data is about the nature of things. So they tend to use words rather than numbers. Right, so we have the following sources of data. We have primary data, which is usually gathered by research by conducting or initiating certain activities to collect the needed information. It is usually in the form of a survey questionnaire, um, conducting interviews, or studying it in the laboratory. So as we can see, we can collect information using this one. But the difference with primary data is it is really you who collected it um, and it's not really someone else. And while when we say secondary data, we are actually uh, collecting information. We are just collecting information by someone who collected it by himself. And this is usually published through journals and reliable sources. So this is what we call secondary data. So the information can be used to further develop your research inquiry. So you have choices in gathering information. So we also have to take into consideration your role as a researcher. So when you conduct your research, when you design your research, you should take note that the core principles should be anchored under ontology and epistemology. So what different roles are you going to play? So are you going to be detached or are you going to be um, you know, attached to the person? So detached or external. So these are just other terms. So if you want to be detached, this is more of a, a positive, positivist approach. So if you employ the positivist approach, the research will have to be detached and external. So seeing reality as independent from our perception perception uh, to it. So remember, when you say positivist, the truth exists, whether you perceive it or not, it's really out there. So it, it is then necessary to employ objective methods in conducting your research. And then we have another role you can play. You can be involved. So in the other end of the spectrum, under social constructionists, a researcher should be involved and should be part of the world of whatever they are studying. So we need to take note that you have the option to be involved. And that is if you're under or employing or your philosophical principle is under social constructionist. Okay? Right. So final thoughts. The choice you make for employing your study involves trade-offs. So there are no right or wrong approach. However, take note that you should be internally consistent since each end of the spectrum has their disadvantages and advantages. At the end of the day, what matters most is you answer your chosen research question. Okay, so let me just emphasize that if you wanted to know how a person perceives things, then, you know, go for social constructionism. If you wanted to know or uncover a law in physics, you know, try to choose positivism. Okay, so it's really up to what you want to explore as a researcher. Right, so don't forget to subscribe 
hit the like button and share this video. In the video description, you will see the link of how to download this uh, PowerPoint presentation. So I'm giving this out to everyone so that they'll be able to use it so that you'll be able to learn more about research and at the same time, share it to other people. And I would like to ask everyone if you can help me, uh, you can share my YouTube channel to your friends. Um, instead of downloading the YouTube video, uh, try to view it so that you can uh, help further our advocacy. Don't forget to visit our video description. You visit our channel so that you'll be able to learn more things about research, education, and e-learning. So. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. And don't forget to comment your thoughts and ideas regarding our discussion today. Thank you and see you in the next video.